from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Um, welcome. I'm Jennifer Harpster. I'm a digital reference specialist with the Science, Technology, and Business Division here at the Library of Congress. Um, I'd like to welcome you to today's program, 400 Years of the Telescope. Well, Galileo, 400 Years of the Telescope. Uh, this program is a first in the series of programs in 2010 that is presented through a partnership between my division and NASA's Space Goddard Flight Center. Our speaker today is Michelle Thaler. She wanted to make astronomy the focus of her life, and I'm quoting her. I just couldn't get outer space out of my head. She received a bachelor degree in astrophysics from Harvard and a doctorate in observational astrophysics at Georgia State University. She specialized in the life and death of massive stars. To a large extent, Michelle's work involves a telescope. As an observer, she has used the Hubble Space Telescope, the ROSAT X-ray satellite, and the International Ultraviolet Explorer satellite. She imparts her love of space to the general public by working in outreach and education. For 10 years, she manned the Spitzer Space Telescope Outreach Program at Caltech and NASA's Jet Propulsion, Propulsion Lab. Uh, but fortunately for us, she has moved east and now she is the Assistant Director of Space for Communications at Goddard. In celebration of 400 years of the telescope, Galileo's first telescopic observations, and the publication of Sidereus Nuncius, Nuncius or Nuncius, <laughs> whichever Latin you want to prefer, um, also known as Starry Messenger, uh, Michelle will take us on an illustrated journey of the real Galileo. And last but not least, we are delighted to have the chief of our rare books and special collections division briefly display the, display the library's unbound copy of Galileo's 1610, Sidarius Nuncius, following the lecture. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Michelle Thaler. Well, good morning, everybody. We have a little chance to relax today together, I hope, and, and enjoy and one of the most incredible stories that I know about in modern science. Galileo Galilei is truly a larger-than-life personality. And as mo many of you probably know, and please come in, and, and for those of you that are, are still uh, coming in, please don't stand on ceremony. Um, I guess I should do a couple things. First of all, um, I know that they're webcasting this. Um, would you, if I can talk to the camera person, would you like me to try to stay behind the podium, or can I move a little bit out, or I'll try to stay here, okay? That's a little unnatural for me. I'm a bit of a wanderer normally. So I'll try to stay put as much as I can here. Um, but at any rate, um, I'm a professional astronomer. I am not a historian of science. And this year was an incredible year for us because 400 years ago, so much was going on in the world of astronomy. The, the, the field revolutionized itself. And we're talking 400 years ago to the day in some cases. Uh, Galileo was making his observations this winter, 400 years ago. And he would be publishing his incredible groundbreaking. And the, 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 uh, the pronunciation is kind of funny. Sidereus Nuncius is probably how he would have said it. Uh, medieval Latin had sort of a soft s. I actually studied, strangely enough, classical conversational Latin. And uh, <laughs> it tells you how much of a geek I am. And um, we would have said Sidereus Nuncius in the classical pronunciation. So I may, I may switch between the two, just when I'm not thinking about it, realize that both have some degree of scholarship behind them. Um, one thing I'll also say, I'll be talking a lot today about the Protestant versus Catholic Church, and I wanted to find some terms, because also at this historical period in time, the Catholic Church would have also been, the Protestants would have called themselves Catholic as well. So when I say Catholic, I do mean the Roman Catholic under the Pope versus the Protestants. So a little bit of terminology there. All right. This is a story which, like I said, 400 years ago, I can almost picture this person. I, I almost feel like I've met him after researching him. So what we'll talk about today, there are probably people in the audience, there are a few that I see already that I know, probably know more about Galileo than I do. And uh, yes, I know. And uh, the, the, the stuff that we're going to talk about today is fairly non-controversial. We'll talk about personalities, events, things that are very well documented. But as far as some detail, hopefully we'll have time for some questions. And I, I welcome suggestions and answers from those who are Galileo experts. So, onward. 
Um, a little bit of a uh, personal note here. I have found this period of history fascinating for much of my life. And I've done a lot of research myself just for fun. Um, I actually belong to a Renaissance dance troupe. We translate original dances from the manuscripts, the French and the, uh, the Spanish, and perform them. And uh, I have, uh, the first time I did this particular lecture was at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in full 17th century costume with a Medici ruff <laughs> and all of that. And uh, the, the venue, we talked about it actually at our telecon, but the venue was a little small for that. So we won't do that today. But, but there, there's me sort of enjoying a bit of a 17th century lifestyle with my husband. Um, there are a couple questions I hope by the end of this talk we'll, we'll answer and what we'll think about at least. And this is an incredible story. Why really was Galileo persecuted for this idea that the earth is not the middle of the universe? Why did the church care so much? There's really nothing in the Bible about it. There are some references to the sun going around, possibly the sun hanging in the sky during a battle, but the Bible doesn't say all that much about this. Why did the church think this was so important? Why were they persecuting people for this belief, even when observations clearly showed otherwise, that the earth is not in the center? Also, who was Galileo and where did he fit into Renaissance society? This was a courtier. This was a member of the Medici court, a very, very high profile person. This was not some scientist working alone in a little lab with nobody ever hearing about them. This is a public figure. And so we'll talk about who he was and how his life sort of bore itself out. What did he observe? I'm going to be showing you scans from the Sidereus Nuncius and other books that show exactly what he observed and why it proved the Earth could not be in the center. There was no longer any question. Then we'll talk a bit about the politics that happened afterwards. Saying that Galileo was a larger-than-life personality is putting it mildly. This was an arrogant, obnoxious, brilliant person who pissed off even his closest friends. Um, he was friends with the Pope to begin with. They, they ended their friendship after he published the, uh, uh, the account of the Earth being not at the center of the universe. We'll look at what really happened in that story. And also, I'd like to end on why I admire Galileo so much. As a scientist, as a modern scientist, I really think of him as the first person that I recognize as someone living a life like me, thinking like I do, an incredible personality. Okay. All right, where did all of this geocentrism start? Now, I mean, all of you probably realize, you remember being a kid, the idea that the Earth moving is a ridiculous idea. The idea that the Earth is hurtling through space at many, many thousands of miles an hour, and that's just around the sun. We were going faster when you compare how, much we, how fast we go around the galaxy or even other speeds. This idea is not an easy one for us to grasp. And um, much of the church doctrine really focuses on this man named Aristotle, who, as you can see, lived from 384 to 322 before the Common Era. Um, Aristotle was a student of Plato and a tutor of Alexander the Great. And one of the reasons we know a lot about this person is this was a very high-ranking person. The tutor of Alexander the Great had a chance to leave a lot of records behind as to what his thoughts were. Um, he is the father, really, of what we think of as, as modern logic, following proofs from one proof to another, a, a flow of logic. He formalized this. He came up with the idea of axioms. There are truths you can prove through reasoning, and these are universal truths that are undisputable. He also devised methods for experimenting, for, just, you know, for figuring out how you know knowledge. So, I mean, this was not somebody who was against experimentation. However, in his system, the idea of deduction and reason went hand in hand with experimentation. The two should agree with each other. And if experimentation didn't really match the way his system of logic worked, he would often sort of say, well, perhaps the error is in the natural world or an observation. The natural world isn't perfect. You'll see that he was a student of Plato, who, of course, thought of the natural world as very imperfect, as sort of a shadow of the real reality. Now, um, he taught that all celestial bodies, anything above the Earth, was perfect and eternal and unchanging, and that the motion of the planets, the five they knew of back in ancient Greece, was perfectly circular and regular. They, were, they went around the same speed around the sun in perfect circles. And the Earth is made of corruptible essences. Earth, fire, water, and air are changeable things. Above the Earth, it's quintessence, the fifth quint, the fifth essence, unchangeable, perfect. So anything above the Earth, by definition, is different from us in its very, very intrinsic nature. Okay, 
what did the church have to do with Aristotle? Aristotle was obviously pre-Christ, a pagan philosopher. Well, a neat thing happened when finally Europe broke out of the Dark Ages. And, and of course, the Dark Ages perhaps are a little bit misnamed. But it, it's amazing to think that we had actually lost all knowledge of the Greek philosophers and scientists and playwrights and all of the arts in ancient Greece. Europe lost that knowledge. It was preserved in the eastern part of Europe, in Constantinople, in the Arabic kingdoms at that time. And when, when the Crusaders went out to conquer Jerusalem, along the way, they found this knowledge that had been lost. It was incredibly exciting, incredibly fashionable. And one of the people that really seized on this was an Italian priest named Thomas Aquinas. Now, Thomas Aquinas, as you can see, 1225 to 1274, um, he's a Dominican priest that is thought of as the, the, the real essence of what a priest should be, extremely reasonable. The idea that faith in God can be arrived at by logic, by reason. He loved Aristotle. He loved this elegant, complete system of the world. Aristotle wrote about how science, nature, religion, ethics, the arts, geometry, all this is one continuous system. So it really was an incredible thing for Thomas Aquinas to find this knowledge. You know, philosophy, oh, that's all right. <laughs> philosophy at this time in Europe was a bit more haphazard. He, they loved the Greeks. So as you can see, what happened is that Thomas Aquinas finds this knowledge. And um, one of the things that he read, uh, there was a famous Roman uh, politician and writer named Cicero. And again, I'll, I'll do my classical Latin. It was Cicero, actually. Um, yeah. Um, Cicero wrote a history of philosophy during the classical Roman time, during you know, the reign of, uh, of Augustus Caesar. And he really loved Aristotle. So some of the first books that Thomas Aquinas comes across, coming out of the eastern parts of Europe, coming out of the Crusades, are Aristotle. Uh, by the way, um, Thomas Aquinas actually had five proofs of God, and some of you are probably familiar with it, proving reasonably why God should exist, and these are based directly on Aristotelian logic. So under the influence of Thomas Aquinas, Aristotle became unquestionable in church doctrine. Now the problem with this stuff is that not everything in the sky seems to move that perfectly. And there was a long known problem with the planets in that when you watch Mars, you know, as you watch Mars night to night move across the sky, Mars appears to stop and move backwards and then continue on its way. It's called retrograde motion. And what you can see here in, in the diagram is you look at, the, these are, this is actually the retrograde motion of Mars for 2003. If you map where Mars is in the sky night to night over, in this case, I guess we're going from uh, you know, probably a couple of months, then you actually see Mars make this backwards movement. Well, that doesn't sound very perfect. What's it doing? And in order to make sure everything had this perfect circular motion, they added something called epicycles, where as the planets orbited around the Earth, they would actually also be orbiting on these little extra circles. And still everything was perfect, everything was uniform, and these epicycles explain this retrograde motion. Um, unfortunately, they don't work that well. When you start taking better measurements of the position of Mars, it doesn't correspond very well to a perfect circle moving on a perfect circle. And so there was a, uh, a famous astronomer in Alexandria, Ptolemy, and he began to add more and more epicycles to try to get this more and more accurate. You know, we just, you, 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 as soon as people were able to make very good observations of where Mars was, observations got better over time. Where was it respect to the other stars? How was its path changing? The circle thing wasn't working. You added epicycles on top of epicycles on top of epicycles. So there was this inelegance to the Aristotelian system when it came to epicycles. So heliocentrism. Let's now switch a little bit and talk about when the idea that the sun was the center of at least our solar system, if not the universe, came about. And a lot of people seem to think that this was something that Copernicus came up with. That's a rather European-centric view. Copernicus came up with this sometime. However, c c heliocentrism goes back a lot farther than that. And to give you an idea, I want to talk a little bit about somebody named Aristarchus of Samos. Now, remember, um, Aristotle was about, I think we're talking about 322. That was about around, you know, around about the time of Aristotle. Aristarchus of Samos is actually writing only about 10 years after the death of Aristotle. By, I, I should say, he was, I think he was born, actually, about 10 years after the birth of Aristotle. So he's probably writing in the vicinity of 40 years after Aristotle. We're talking more than 2,000 years ago. Ar Aristarchus of Sam Samos actually had proof 
that the, the Earth could not be in the middle of our solar system. So why didn't this idea take over from Aristotle? It actually is the correct idea. Um, Aristarchus is not much of a formal philosopher. He was more of a natural philosopher. He studied the natural world. He wasn't lauded all that much by the Romans. They didn't mention him. But Aristotle and his incredible universal system got a lot more attention. He also was from Samos. Samos is a relative backwater town of Greece. So he didn't quite have the profile that Aristotle did as well. Interestingly enough, Galileo did know about the work of Aristarchus. He actually mentions it in a famous letter that I'll talk about later on called the, le the letter to the Archduchess Christina. Okay, what did, what did Aristarchus observe? How can we show that the Earth is not in the center? Have you ever asked a grade school kid, you know, without a telescope, without any other scientific instrument, how could you prove to me that the Earth is not the center of the universe. It seems obvious the Earth is not moving. We are the center. Well, cleverly, he looked at lunar eclipses. A lunar eclipse, we now know, is when the, the moon actually passes into the shadow of the Earth. And as you can see here, this is a time uh, lapse of a lunar eclipse. And if you notice, you can actually see the curve of the Earth on either side here, the Earth's shadow. So as the moon goes through a lunar eclipse, do you see on either side, I'll just tip up a little bit, two images of the moon. I'm so sorry, it's a little hard to see that with the podium. You can actually see a curved shadow on the moon in both cases. All right, that's the Earth's shadow. Now, the Earth's shadow, as you can see, is a lot bigger than the moon, but you can see sunlight all the way around the Earth's shadow. So there's a shadow of the Earth, but something is glowing on either side of that shadow. There's light on both sides. And he also noticed that you get lunar eclipses at many different kinds of angles. Sometimes the shadow hits the top of the moon. Sometimes it hits the side of the moon. Sometimes it goes right over the moon and there's a total lunar eclipse. Now the only object that can project a circular shadow from any direction is a sphere. So that's a proof that the Earth is a sphere. The Earth's shadow from any direction you look at it is circular. The only shape that can do that is a sphere. So we know the Earth is spherical. You'll also see that there's light on either side. So whatever the sun is, whatever is projecting the light, must be larger than the Earth. Relatively simple reasoning. Why should something larger than the Earth go around the Earth? Doesn't it make more sense that the larger object should be the center and the smaller Earth should go around it? In fact, Aristarchus actually estimated the size of the moon using this. Um, his, measures, his measurements were not great. He didn't really have a very good way of making very precise measurements of angles. He didn't get the perfect uh, distance to the moon or the size of the moon, but he was working on it. Um, in some cases, I'm kind of amazed how close he came. Um, he had a bit of trouble. Th there was one time he actually tried to measure the distance to the sun using this. And he reasoned that when the moon is at half phase, the Earth, the moon, and the sun make this sort of right triangle, as you see in the diagram there. And if you can measure the angle between the moon and the sun, you can use trigonometry to figure out what that distance is. If I, uh, if, if I could go over to the screens, I'd probably go and point out how that worked, but I think you can probably see that there a little bit. Um, he didn't get it right, but he estimated the sun being about 5 million miles away. In truth, the sun is about 93 million miles away. But 5 million miles away is a lot of distance for a person from ancient Greece. You know, that, that's bigger than their local world. So he had this idea that the sun was very far away. He estimated the sun to be about five times diameter larger than the Earth. The, uh, the sun is actually many times larger than that. It's about 110 times the Earth's diameter. However, this person, 2,000 years ago, was beginning to get the scale of our solar system right. And he actually also estimated distances to the stars, and this blows me away. He assumed the stars were like the sun. And he said, okay, well, if they're that faint in the sky, how far away does that have to be? He actually drilled a, uh, a bronze plate with tiny little holes, and he would hold it up to the sun, and he would see how bright the little pinpricks of light were and compare them to the stars. And he used that to estimate the distance to the stars as much farther away than the sun. Now, he had a better explanation for this retrograde motion. The retrograde motion is very easily understood as what you see when one planet passes by another in its orbit around the sun. And as you can see here, you know, I on the bottom, uh, if you, oh, the diagram over to, uh, to your right, the Earth is actually going to be passing by Mars in its orbit. And th the classic example is when you pass a car on, on the freeway. Okay, you're driving you know, alongside a car. You both seem to be going forward to your perspective. And then as you pass by, the car appears to move backwards against the background. 
Yeah, but that, that's retrograde motion. You're passing something by, and it appears to move backwards. You're both moving forward, but the Earth just sort of bypasses Mars, and you get this little backwards motion. Aristarchus had this figured out. This is what happens. Just a little note uh, for those of you who think that uh, Christopher Columbus discovered the Earth was round. I Unfortunately, and I don't think many people do, hopefully, um, I actually was asked to say that. I do a lot of television, and the Discovery Channel one time had me scripted to say, well, when Christopher Columbus you know, discovered the Earth was round, no, definitely not. Um, the, the Earth being a sphere has been known for a long time. Even in Europe, we have globes older than Christopher Columbus. So, um, But uh, the circumference of the Earth was very well known in ancient Greece. Aristosthenes, and again, uh, I really, if, if you don't know the technique he used, he just watched, one day, one day there was, the sun would shine directly down a well in Alexandria, but it wouldn't shine directly down a well in Syene, a little bit of ways away. So that meant that it was a curved surface. And he actually measured the circumference of the Earth to better than 1%. So he measured it at, uh, yeah, 39,690 kilometers. Yeah, circumference. So, I mean, we, we actually even knew the scale of the Earth back then. Okay, on to Copernicus. Okay, so Copernicus wasn't the first person to propose heliocentrism. And one of the myths as well is that at the time of Copernicus, this was some sort of huge offense. Copernicus really was never threatened with heresy or with punishment. He might have been a little nervous because he was, he was contradicting Aristotle. And contradicting Aristotle did go against the teachings of the church, but at the time Copernicus was publishing, things were slightly more relaxed. Galileo found himself in a very bad time in history where Catholics and Protestants were fighting very, very contentiously. Um, when Aristotle announced his idea about the heliocentric universe, he actually wrote to the Archbishop of Capua, and we have a little bit of, of the, the uh, excerpt of the letter that you know, he says, with the utmost earnestness, I entreat you, most learned sir, to communicate this discovery of yours to scholars at the earliest possible moment to send me your writings. So he was actually encouraged by his local church authorities to publicize this heliocentric idea. It was an interesting idea. It wasn't Aristotle. It was controversial, maybe a little beyond the pale. But Copernicus himself was not persecuted for this belief. Things were really changing at that time in Europe. Like I said, the Reformation had happened, and now courts were taking sides. There were some countries that were Protestant, some countries that were Catholic. And in some cases, there were countries that tried to have some sort of sense of normalcy between the two groups. Elizabeth I is very famous for encouraging peace between Catholics and Protestants. Other countries, it was incredibly violent. You, know, you risked your life by taking mass if you were Catholic or by having a, a Bible that wasn't in Latin if you were Protestant. I mean, people were killed for this, lots and lots of people. Also, the idea of the earth not being in the center was difficult to take. I mean, one of my favorite historical figures from this, this, this particular time is Tycho Brahe. Uh, Tycho Brahe was a Danish astronomer. And again, a very, very larger than life person. Uh, he's very famous for his gold nose. Yeah, have you guys heard, is, is it people, have some people have heard Tycho Brahe? Okay, he was a, an astronomer and a mathematician. And he supposedly got in a duel ab about who was the best mathematician as a young man and got the edge of his nose sliced off. And uh, w from that point on, wore either a gold, silver, or possibly copper nose that was held on with wax. And uh, he, uh, he famously, when, when I started researching this talk, I couldn't believe this. So I actually, there, there actually is evidence he had a tame moose. <laughs> and um, a moose would have been a North American animal, but that would have been incredibly rare and incredibly expensive to bring a moose over. There is some scholarship it was an elk and not a moose, but th there, there's, there's actually, there appears to be controversy as to whether it was an elk or a moose. He fed it on beer, and uh, <laughs> unfortunately the thing died after it fell down the stairs after too much beer. I, <laughs> wow. Now, um, what an amazing idea to be an astronomer before the age of the telescope. This is before telescopes, right? How, how are you an astronomer without a telescope? Well, he had this incredible island called Uraniborg, the place of Urania, the, the muse of astronomy. And he had giant buildings set up with, with basically uh, protractors, things to measure angles on the sky. And you'll notice at the bottom there, there's actually a woodblock print of Tycho Brahe sitting in one of these giant angular measurement devices in his observatory. Um, this is all ruined now. Actually, I've been to the site of Uraniborg. There's a little bit of foundation left, but unfortunately none of the buildings are still standing. But he had very, very good measurements of what the angle in the sky of these planets were. He could not deal with the idea the Earth was moving, and he proposed what he called the Tychonic system, which is a bit of a bastardization between geocentrism and heliocentrism. It was very evident now that planets orbited the sun, but the Earth couldn't move, so what he did is he had the sun go around the Earth and all the planets go around the sun. 
So as you see, can you see from the diagram there, you've got the Earth in the center, and the sun still goes around the Earth, but all the planets orbit around the sun, except the Earth, the Earth is still. So you know, he, he just couldn't deal with this idea that the Earth might be moving. All right, uh, again, to give you a sense of what's going on in Europe, there's the amazing Johannes Kepler, and, and this is an, a very, a very important anniversary for him as well this year. Um, he was a German mathematician, and he actually wrote Galileo. As soon as he heard Galileo had this amazing new instrument, the two men had communicated before. He really wanted one. Uh, Galileo never gave him one. <laughs> I think the idea of having competition from Kepler was a little too much. I'm sure he obtained one at some point, but never from Galileo. Um, in 1609, he wrote the Astronomica Nova. And in this book on astronomy, not only did he have a heliocentric universe with the sun in the middle, but the planets didn't go in perfect circles. They went in ellipses. And they actually changed their speed. When they were closer to the sun, they went faster. And they got slower as they went away. Kepler's laws of planetary motion. These are the laws that I still study today in basic physics. 400 years ago, this person had got that. Now, a contrast is England. England was also a Protestant court, but quite behind the times scientifically. Um, Elizabeth did support heliocentrism, mainly because it pissed the Catholics off, seriously. Um, I mean, if the Catholics were going to say the Earth is in the center and other courts of Europe, Protestant-wise, were going to go with heliocentrism, that was a political decision for Elizabeth. Um, the, the, the primary scientist in her court was a man named John Dee. And I do use the term scientist with big quotation marks here. All scientists at this time did make some money casting horoscopes. Galileo did, Kepler did, all these people. So there wasn't a real true separation between astrology and astronomy. John Dee, however, was a bit beyond the pale. Um, not only was he the queen's astrologer, and he was the only one allowed to cast Queen Elizabeth's horoscope. For anyone else, it was a treasonous capital offense. If you tried to cast the queen's horoscope, you would be killed, and the reason is you might be able to predict the time of her death. This was serious. I mean, this was looked on as a science, and if you could predict when the queen would die, you could influence politics. Now, John Dee got a lot of his advice from angels that he, seri this, uh, absolutely serious, he got advice from angels who would speak to him through a mirror, through a looking glass. And John Dee was actually honest enough to say that he could not see or hear these angels, but his assistant could. So John Dee had an assistant that would actually gaze into both crystals and a mirror, which at the time was sort of a magical device, and, and, and have prognostications this way. This was the, co the court of Elizabeth I's idea of science. All right, Galileo Galilei. Let's now start on the story of him and concentrate mainly on this person. So we've seen heliocentrism is nothing new. People have known about this for thousands of years. Geocentri geocentrism versus heliocentrism is a political religious divide right now. Into this environment, Galileo was born, uh, 1564. Uh, he was born as the oldest of six children of Vincenzo Galilei, a noted musician. He was a lutenist. And he was sent to the University of Padua. His father wanted him to be a doctor. So very, very typical family. He wanted to have a doctor in the family. So uh, he actually didn't uh, stay in medicine very long. He very quickly changed to mathematics. Uh, a little bit of a note here on the, uh, the pictures of Pisa. The, uh, the, the, you all know of the Leaning Tower of Pisa, and you can actually see it at the very end, the far right-hand side of these, uh, these pictures. And that's a tourist you know, in front, sort of pretending they're propping up so they can take a picture with their hand against the Tower of Pisa. Everybody does that. Um, you may have heard the famous myth that Galileo dropped two balls off the, off the Leaning Tower of Pisa to see if two objects of different weights fall at the same rate. There's no evidence of this. One of Galileo's students did claim that he did this. It's not against his personality. Galileo loved big public spectacles. He loved attention for his experiments. We don't have any record of him doing it, but he may have done it. Okay, in 1592, he actually moves to Padua to become a uh, professor at, uh, at the University of Mathematics. Um, Padua is a city that was at the time under the control of Venice. Now, this is very important. There are very powerful city-states in Italy. Venice and Florence are two competing city-states. And they also want to jockey against each other. You know, what, what Florence is doing, Venice would kind of like to encourage something else to happen. So the Florentines were much more conservative and much closer to Rome in their philosophies. The Venetians had to kind of stick it to them. And so the Venetians encouraged beliefs like heliocentrism, these, these more fashionable new ideas, because of a political conflict with Florence. So he, uh, he actually was a very uh, popular professor. He, he caught the eye of the court. And the Medici court, actually, the, the Grand Duke Ferdinand decided to bring him to Florence to tutor his son. So at this time as well, and we'll mention this a little bit more later, he did have three children. 
and the children were with Marina de Gamba, his housekeeper. He, he never married Marina. Uh, this was not considered all that unusual at the time. I mean, nobody, as far as we know, really chastised Galileo for this. This wasn't really a scandal. Um, Galileo was of a certain class. He was a professor. He was, he, was, he was entering the court scene. And having a few illegitimate children on the side with your housekeeper is something that happened. So like I said, th this perhaps shouldn't be viewed quite as salaciously as, as it might do. Now, trouble started when in 1604, a supernova explosion happened. This is a picture, actually. This is how the supernova remnant appears today. This was a star that exploded. And I'm not, I actually knew this once. I used to know exactly how far away the star was. I actually helped make this image. <laughs> so this is an image that's near and dear to my heart. Um, but the, the light reached Earth in 1604. And all of a sudden, for a few days, there was a new star in the sky. Now, that goes against Aristotle's idea that everything is unchanging in the heavens. And Galileo pointed this out and, and pointed out why this meant that Aristotle was wrong. He was very blunt about it. Um, he actually used parallax. Parallax is basically when you look at something from one angle and then from another angle, it appears to move. You, the, the classic example is if you hold your thumb out and you close one eye and then another, your thumb appears to move against the background. Things that are close to the Earth, you actually can observe them against stars and see that they move over time. They have a parallax, a shift. This object didn't do that. So Galileo argued this must be very far away. And so the idea that a star blew up was causing him some trouble. Uh, the Aristotelians already took note that this guy was, was a troublemaker. A little bit about his family then. Uh, th I mean, th so the, the, that sort of went away. There was the controversy of the 1604 supernova that kind of died away. He settled into court life, into professorial life. Um, we have wonderfully preserved letters from Galileo to probably his favorite child. Uh, the problem with the two daughters, he had two daughters and a son, and the two daughters were really unmarriageable in this society. They were illegitimate. Even though their father was a popular professor, a member of the court, he really couldn't do anything for them. There was no way to marry a young woman who didn't have any official family. So the best thing he could do for them is put them in a convent. He put them in the convent when they were 12 and 13 years old. And even at this time, that was considered too young for uh, a woman to make vows. You, know, you weren't really wise enough in your own mind. He got special dispensation from the pope to put him in the convent. So the convent was the, uh, uh, the poor Clares in uh, the San Mateo convent of our century. And uh, this was a very, very austere convent. I, I, I think many of them were at this time. Uh, uh, Suar Mar Maria Celeste often writes to him for more food, for warmth. They, they, they were very, very Spartan in their existence. But the two exchanged letters, and we have over, over I, I believe, about 300 letters surviving from these, uh, these two. Unfortunately, as a nun, when Maria Celeste died, they burnt all her belongings. They didn't archive them. They didn't keep them. She was just a, a, a nun in this, uh, this convent. So we have all of Galileo's letters from her. He kept them but we don't have any back. We don't have any of the ones that he actually wrote her. And uh, there's a neat book uh, uh, by, by David Sobel called Galileo's Daughter, which talks about this. The letters, unfortunately, I, I think the, the right word was used earlier today, is rather banal. Um, she talks to him a lot about sewing his collars, doing his laundry, uh, preparing medicines for him. But she was also well aware that he was getting in trouble with authorities. And when Galileo would be asked to do a penance, you know, for those of you that are Catholics, if you, if you sin against the church or you've done something wrong, you have to say a number of rosaries. She would do them for him. So she was aware that he was getting in trouble because she was doing his penance. To, to, so, I mean, very interesting person. Um, what you see, that, that little diagram in the middle of the page is a horoscope that he cast for her. So he actually you know, was uh, in, in constant communication with her. A little bit of an aside, uh, a, re a relatively large crater on Venus has recently been named after her. So there is the Maria Celeste crater. That's a radar image, the, the big gray square there, and a picture of Venus. So we, we now have a crater commemorating this, this woman. As I mentioned, Galileo was very popular. He was very good at spectacle, at getting the public involved in what he was doing. He was very good at seeking patronage. And the most powerful family at the time in Italy were the Medicis. This is a crest of the Medicis carved in marble in one of their, their, uh, their palaces. The Medicis ruled Florence, and they often were the people who appointed popes. They were incredibly politically uh, powerful. He was brought to Florence to tutor the son of the Grand Duke. This is a big appointment. Okay, the Grand Duke is one of the people that rules Italy. 
And he was actually sent to, uh, to tutor Cosimo II, the son of Ferdinand. Now, Cosimo II is really wonderful. We actually have a baby picture. That, that's a, a portrait of Cosimo as a baby over on the left. And uh, the portrait over on the right is a posthumous portrait. He didn't live very long. He only lived to be 31. But he married uh, an Austrian princess and fathered eight children. And uh, the, uh, the, the person that's too the behind him over to, uh, to your right in, in the dark clothing, that's his son. That's Ferdinando. So Cosimo II was Galileo's pupil, and he did actually rise to become the Grand Duke, a very close friend, incredibly powerful protector of Galileo. Florence, like I said, was an amazing place. I mean, a center of culture, a center of political power, much closer to Rome than, than I mean, not, not so much geographically as politically, belief-wise. So when, when Galileo moved away from Padua into this more cosmopolitan setting, he was moving away from the protection of a court that liked outliers, that liked people that could be a little difficult with the authorities. Here he had to be a bit more careful in his politics. Now at this time, people were beginning to invent what would soon become the telescope. The telescope was not invented to look at the sky. It was actually invented to look out at sea, the Dutch spy glasses. The first records we have are of Dutch sailors using these, both to sight ships on the horizon, but there was also a political reason for it too. Um, at a seaport, you really couldn't know what ship was going to come in bringing sugar or, or, or bringing fabrics. And so when a ship arrived, there was sort of this run on the market. All of a sudden, there was a lot of sugar, a lot of fabrics in the port. And so by using spyglasses, they could recognize boats very far away and then start investing and buying. So there was actually, <laughs> there was actually an economic reason to use these as well. And, and, and of course, defense. I mean, if you see an enemy fleet coming in, you want to see them as far away as possible. So these were getting a lot of interest. At the time, they magnified ab about two times. So I mean, I mean, really, not very much magnification at all. Um, Galileo improved this to three times. And, and, and for this, he actually had a, a huge demonstration. He went to Venice. And he actually gave a demonstration to the nobles from the bell tower in, in uh, Piazza San Marco. And uh, we, we know it was recorded. It was August 25th, 1609. Um, he was actually given a professorship and a pension for life because of this, for service to the city of Venice. He was awarded a pension for life just because of that. I mean, he hadn't pointed it up at the sky yet. This is just for his use of the spyglass. Here's some uh, Galileo era spyglasses. Th th there, there were some wonderful displays this year all around the world of original telescopes. Uh, th I think there are at least two that they know Galileo made. I think that's all. But uh, these are at least period telescopes from Galileo's time. They're beautiful. Look at the, the paper, all the colors. I had a chance to hold some of these. I was at the Adler Planetarium, and they let me hold some of these 17th century telescopes. Amazing. OK, so Galileo obviously then was the first person to make astronomical observations with a telescope, right? No. No, actually not. Um, we, we actually know very certainly that he was not, because this English man named Thomas Harriet, there's a drawing that you see there over on the side of the terminator of the moon, the shadow area of the moon, and it's dated, you can just see, 1609 July. Galileo began his astronomical observations in the winter of 1609, so he said in, in his journals. So there was a person that was already using this, but he didn't publicize it very much. So unfortunately, we really don't know of Thomas Harriet as the first person to use the telescope. These are some drawings. Uh, the, uh, the one on the, the left is actually the drawing that Harriet made of the entire moon. And then the one on the right is a sketch by Galileo. As you can see, the, the sketch by Harriet is much more accurate in terms of where the dark and light areas are on the moon. In the case of Galileo, he very well may have been just sort of looking at, at, at sort of the, the view through his eyepiece. His intent was not to make a whole map of the moon. But it's a little bit sketchier. He's demonstrating a principle. The craters have these raised walls, and they're casting shadows. But Harriet may have even made the better maps of the moon to begin with. Now, after spending a winter, and, and think about this. So that there's a man working in, in Italy in his backyard, literally, with a, with a spyglass. I mean, a good pair of binoculars is more magnification than this. At that time, this was the premier astronomical observatory in the world. You know, the world would change on this man working in his backyard. Excuse me. He came out with a book about what he had observed. And the amazing thing that's going to happen today later on is we have an original copy of this book, a 400-year-old book that's going to be displayed right outside. So if you would like to see the, an original Sidereus Nuncius, 
that it's an incredible proposition. There's not many people that actually get a chance to see that. I really thank the Library of Congress for that opportunity. Now, this is, a, uh, uh, this is actually a scan of, of an original Sedarius that he gave away to a courtier. That is actually his signature at the bottom. So that, that's an autographed copy of a Sedarius Nuncius to a courtier. And uh, again, th this was received to great acclaim. Knowing how to really push patronage, one of the things we'll talk about is he discovered moons around Jupiter. He called them the Medicean stars after his patrons. Unfortunately, that, that name did not really uh, stick around. And this is another myth. Um, one of the things, actually, I'll, I'll just sort of go here. Um, one of the myths is that people didn't believe Galileo was seeing things through his telescope. There may have been one or two people that said, okay, you're looking through a silly little tube and you're telling me you're seeing things very far away. The thing was the Jesuit astronomers were very, very forward thinking and at the time had almost immediately whatever Galileo had in terms of instrumentation, in terms of observational knowledge. So the Jesuit astronomers almost immediately confirmed everything Galileo observed. And they actually honored him at a banquet. He was very popular with the Jesuits at this time. They loved these observations. Here's a little diagram of the telescope. One of the first things he mentions in this book is he looked at the Milky Way. And what an incredible idea that when you look at the Milky Way, even through binoculars, try it sometime, the sort of lightish area resolves itself into many, many thousands of tiny stars. What an incredible idea that God made stars that can only be seen through an instrument. Why did he put them there? It sort of makes us feel not quite so central anymore, maybe not even so central to God's plans. Um, these are some diagrams of the constellation Orion from the book. And again, in Orion, he discovered far more stars than he could see by his, uh, his naked eye. And even to the map of the, Neb the Orion Nebula, you know, a beautiful place where there are thousands of stars being born right now. So the idea that there were more stars than you could see was an incredibly profound philosophical idea. Here's, uh, I think this uh, is the Pleiades, I believe. Yeah, he did the Pleiades and the Precipice culture, uh, sorry, cluster. Uh, I love the illustrations. Hopefully we'll have a chance to actually look at some of those later on. Here are some moon maps. And as you can see, the idea that the moon was a perfect object, Aristotle actually taught that it was a perfect sphere. I mean, we, we can all see that there are different colors on the moon. Bits are dark and bits are light. But Aristotle said that really didn't matter. It was still a perfect, smooth sphere. Well, as soon as you look at it through even low-resolution binoculars, you can tell it's not. There are shadows, there are mountains, there are walls. This is not a smooth object. This goes against Aristotle, but again, the Jesuits at this point were excited by this. And here's something that was even more profound. There were these four little stars around the planet Jupiter. And night to night, the little stars changed positions. You could actually sort of see that there was a cycle to the way they changed. Could it be that something was orbiting a body other than the Earth? Yeah. So these, these four little stars are orbiting around Jupiter. They didn't know they were moons. They just knew they were tiny little stars. And this was very interesting because if Earth is the center of all rotation, if Earth is the center of all movement, how could this be? So this was beginning to break down the idea that the Earth was in the center. So here we have sort of a, I th believe this is a, a 20th century uh, idea of Galileo uh, showing his observations to very skeptical cardinals. It, it, it wasn't quite like this. I mean, I mean, Galileo at the time was getting fans. You know, he was very, very popular. In the court, he was became an incredibly popular figure because of this book. There's some uh, scans from the original uh, Sidereus Nuncius of these little stars changing position night to night. Okay, now here's something that's a little bit less talked about, but it actually proves that the Aristotelian system is wrong. It, it actually was the nail in the coffin, and that was the phases of Venus. Venus, if you look at it through a telescope, goes through phases like our moon. It actually is full some of the time and crescent some of the time. Okay, th that's kind of neat, but why does that prove that the Earth is not in the center? Well, look what happens when you actually compare the two models. Okay, here's, here's some observations just to show you. These are actually pictures taken in 2002 of Venus. Venus, when it's close to us, well, I shouldn't say, they didn't know that at the time. It's, when it's crescent, it's very large. When it's, it's full, it's very small. So it changes shape and it goes through phases. Okay, this diagram is a comparison of the two systems. Let's start with the Earth-centered system, which is over on your left. In the Aristotelian system, people had observed that both Mercury and Venus stay pretty close to the sun. 
You see the sun in the sky, neither of those planets gets very far away. They kind of cycle back and forth. So Aristotle said there basically is a line connecting the Earth to the sun, and these two planets orbit centered on that line. So if that's true, picture that you're on Earth and you're looking at Venus. That means the sun is always on the other side of Venus. Venus is always closer to us than the sun. So as Venus cycles around, we only see it in the crescent phase. We never see it as full, because to be full, it has to be on the other side of the sun. W when you're an astronomer, you're used to these diagrams. Do, do people see this? Do people see that, that that's the case? And in the, in the sun-centered system, you can actually have the Earth and Venus on opposite sides of the sun very easily. They're just in different parts of their orbit. They're on the opposite side of the sun. But in the Earth-centered Aristotelian system, you couldn't have that. That was it. Okay, Aristotle's system is now proven to not be correct. He went on to do other observations, too. Obviously, some people at this time are beginning to get a little worried about him, and we'll talk about that later. Uh, he did observations of sunspots, and uh, this has to be one of the... the that, that's a very strange-looking woodcut cut of Galileo. He's got this big smile on his face. Like I said, this was a courtier. A, m a person who liked to promote himself, somebody who was very interested in public attention. And he's smiling there, sort of like a used car salesman or something. I mean, I, I've, 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 I've looked at this woodcut many times, and I just I can never take it quite seriously. Um, interestingly enough, again, Galileo was not the first person to observe sunspots. There are several records we have. There seem to be some very old Chinese observations, not very well documented. Kepler actually saw a sunspot in 1607 when he projected the sun through an instrument, but he thought it was Mercury. He thought it was a planet, but we, we actually know now it was a sunspot. Mercury wasn't at that point in its orbit when he made that observation. Um, Galileo and Harriet, we talked about James Harriet before, and also a Jesuit astronomer named Shiner, all were observing sunspots around the same time. Interestingly enough, the first people to publish them were a father-son team named David and Johannes Fabricius, and they published about them in 1611, and they correctly thought they were spots on the sun. So they, people knew about this. This is actually Shiner's work. Uh, this is Shiner's apparatus of projecting the sun through a telescope onto a piece of paper, and these are his observations of sunspots. Now, Shiner thought that the sun was still perfect, and these spots must have been maybe little, little moons orbiting very close to the sun. But G Galileo really lambasted that idea and said, if you actually think about it, it's pretty stupid. They have to be right on the surface of the sun. So there's a, uh, there's a neat series of, uh, of drawings that Galileo made of sunspots. And he oriented the sun the same way on each page and the same size. And if you do a time lapse of them, you see something very interesting. Let me just play this animation. OK, that's a time lapse of Galileo's drawings, one after another. And you can see that the same series of sunspots move their way across the sun, and they even, sort of, they even sort of distort at the edges like they're going around. When you look at these drawings one after another, do you get the impression the sun is rotating? Yeah. So I an incredible idea that the sun itself might be rotating, and these are actually on the surface of the sun. Galileo was not real friendly with Shiner about this. I mean, he lambasted him, called him a fool. So astronomers all over Europe were really sort of risking the wrath of Galileo to, if they it, it said anything about him being wrong. This was making him unpopular. And trouble was beginning to brew, not just in academic circles, but also religious circles. The two were probably combined. Remember, most of the academic astronomers at this time were also Jesuit priests. So when they got pissed off by Galileo, one of the things they could do was grab the church authorities and say, hey, this person's causing trouble. One of his patrons, his great friend, was the Archduchess Christina. This was the mother of Cosimo. And Christina wrote to him and, and, and said, I'm worried. I'm hearing that you are saying things against the Bible that may be heretical. And Galileo wrote back what has to be one of the most incredible defenses of observation and rational thought that I've ever read. I don't want to take a whole lot of time, but I do want to read a couple excerpts. Um, I won't read all of these, but uh, don't worry about reading them. I'll read them to you. But the idea that God is known first through nature and again by doctrine, by nature and his works and by doctrine and his revealed world. I love this, this, this next one. I do not feel obliged to believe that the same God who has endowed us with senses, reason, and intellect has intended us to forego their use and by some other means to give us knowledge which we can attain them. He would not require us to deny sense and reason in physical matters which are set before our eyes and minds by direct experience or necessary demonstrations. 
This must be especially true in those sciences of which but the faintest trace, and that consisting of conclusions to be found in the Bible. Of astronomy, for instance, so little is found that none of the planets except Venus, sorry, lost my place, Venus is so much as mentioned, and only once or twice by the name of Lucifer. If the sacred scribes had any intention of teaching people certain arrangements and motions of the heavenly bodies, or they had wished us to derive such knowledge from the Bible, then in my opinion, they would not have spoken of these matters so sparingly. We, we can read more, but Galileo was basically saying, and this is actually from the letter, this is not just something kind of cute, that he quotes a, a clergyman as saying, those truths, ah, um, oh, here we go. The intention of the Holy Ghost to teach us how one goes to heaven, not how heaven goes. Right? The Bible doesn't teach us astronomy. The Bible, in, it, I mean, he, Galileo actually says the people who wrote the Bible decided not to do this at all. It's not the place of the Bible to teach us things we can observe directly. There are two ways to know God. As an astronomer at NASA, I've often been asked to comment and to talk to people who believe in evolution versus creation. Um, I was actually sent to the Kansas School Board to talk to people about this. Um, they, they like to send people that are friendly and, and kind of non-threatening, and uh, I, I, I try to be that. Um, but one of the things I, I said to them, you know, remember there was a time when the Earth being in the center w w was, was a capital offense. Knowledge has changed, and it has been uncomfortable for humans to sometimes take that change. But the idea that God would give us observations and not allow us to believe them, there are two ways to know God. There is nature and there is scripture. And when there appears to be a disagreement, we're observing something in nature that doesn't seem scriptural, it's human error that causes that. It's not God. It's an error in interpretation of what we think God may have said. I was called the handmaiden of Satan for that. But <laughs> <laughs> That's one of my favorite monikers, actually. Um, <laughs> anyway, speaking b back to the story. Now, unfortunately, one of the people that really was getting a lot of complaints about Galileo was the Grand Inquisitor. And this is a very interesting person, not a simple person, not a person who is just a slathering, dogmatic monster. Um, Cardinal Roberto Bellarmine it, it was a very intellectual person. He was the Grand Inquisitor. And he actually was from the Netherlands, which at this point was becoming Protestant more and more. And he was, in, he was actually born in one of the last bulwarks of Catholicism against this cringing Protestantism. And he was a huge fan of Thomas Aquinas, of reason, and of Aristotle. And uh, he, he tried to reason with heretics. He actually published a famous letter called Disputations About the Controversies of the Christian Faith Against Heretics of This Time. He drew on Aristotelian logic for this and the teachings of Aquinas. He was a very reasonable person. Um, he lived a simple, pious life. Interestingly enough, we have on record that for a while he liked to study astronomy but gave it up because of the dangerous thoughts it was creating. Very, very interesting. So trouble was brewing. Galileo had made a lot of enemies. And um, one of the things that happened is people started preaching against him from the pulpit. That was not a safe thing to do. Galileo had the patronage of the Medicis. So in 1614, there was a priest named Tommaso Caccini, and he preached against Galileo. One of his superiors had to apologize to the Medicis for that. So at this point, Galileo was still very well protected by the Medicis. So in 1616, they actually decided to rule on Copernicus. Copernicus, at this point, they knew he was heliocentric. They knew that that, that wasn't Aristotelian. But the, the Catholic Church had not felt it necessary to come out and proclaim Copernicus a heretic. In 1616, they did. So that was the first time. And, and really, this had to do with the politics of Europe, the Protestants and the Catholics fighting. They had to come out with a, a, a stand. I just want to tell you a little bit about one of the things that Cardinal Bellarmine was involved in was the persecution of Giardo, Giordano Bruno. It turns out today is the 400th anniversary of his death. Today, February 17th. Um, this was somebody who advocated the sun being in the center. He also believed that the stars were suns with worlds around them himself. Um, he actually was kind of an itinerant priest. He, he got kicked out of many monasteries for his beliefs. Uh, joined the Calvinists, the Protestants, for a little while. Ended up in, uh, in France. Uh, Galileo and Bruno's paths had to have crossed. Uh, he tried to get a teaching job at Oxford, but then he tried to go to Padua, and the chair of mathematics went to Galileo instead of him. So this was sort of a, a, a contemporary, a little bit of a competitor of Galileo. Now, it's worth mentioning that when they actually executed Bruno, they had not ruled on Copernicus yet. Bruno was probably not executed because of his beliefs in heliocentrism. Those were bad. 
but he actually d doubted the divinity of Christ and the virgin birth and believed the universe had no center. And these things were much more important to the Catholic Church than heliocentrism. But anyway, they burnt him at the stake 400 years ago today. Oh, okay, that's a good question. And I, 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 don't, I, I don't know, and that, that probably makes a pretty significant difference, so, yeah. Okay, so things were going badly for Galileo. He was still protected by the Medicis, but then something really good happened. An old friend of his was elected to be pope. This is Pope Urban VIII, Mafio Barberini. Uh, that's an actual portrait on the right side by Caravaggio of him, and a, wood, a woodblock print on the other side. He and Galileo were longtime friends. That we have many letters between the two of them. This was not a particularly dogmatic pope. He was more known for nepotism, you know, very controversial nepotism, than he was for dogma. And uh, one of the more famous things he did was he actually melted down these big Roman bronze uh, beams in the, uh, the Pantheon to decorate St. Peter's with. And that actually caused the, uh, the a wonderful quote that basically, quote, non fecorunt barbari, fecorunt barberini, which means what the barbarians didn't do, Barberini did. <laughs> so things that had survived even the barbarians coming through Rome, Barberini was melting down to decorate St. Peter's. But at any rate. In 1623, Galileo went to visit his friend. And they walked together in the garden. We, we hear about this from Galileo's writings. And they talked about this idea of heliocentrism. And basically, the pope said, you are fine to teach it as long as you teach it as a theory. You don't have to say whether it's true or not. We're never going to know which one is actually real. He also said that God can make the world appear any way he wants to. This is kind of platonic, the idea that the natural world is perhaps corrupt, not perfect. And if God wanted to make the world appear a way, even though it wasn't really that way, then he could. It's actually a fairly sophisticated argument. So at the time, he had a friend in the pope, somebody who was, who was familiar with him, somebody who was protecting him, and Galileo felt that he now could really start to talk about heliocentrism. This is when he wrote a number of things that again began to make him more enemies. Uh, one of the first things he wrote under the, uh, uh, the patronage of the pope was something called the Assayer. And the Assayer was a, a neat little, little note that uh, unfortunately really reamed down on the Jesuit astronomers. The Jesuit astronomers had observed a comet earlier that year. And by using parallax, they proposed that the comet was much farther away than the moon. But Galileo knew that comets were atmospheric phenomena. They're just in our atmosphere. And he wrote a letter just lambasting these Jesuit astronomers, calling them idiots. Now, comets are farther away than the moon. So in this case, the Jesuits were right. Um, you know, more bad remarks about Shiner, more bad remarks about professors. Um, there was a controversy about floating objects and how they follow the rules of Archimedes more than Aristotle. At, at, at dinner conversations, at, at court events, that this person was picking arguments. So the, the personality of Galileo seems to be kind of getting in his own way here. He was actually warned that there was, a something, something, uh, there was a painter who warned him that something called the Pigeon League, in quotation marks, I don't, I don't really know what that means, was out to get him. And they would use his heliocentrism, if necessary, as an excuse. So I mean, people were out to get him at this point. Then he did something which, uh, honestly, I have not really been able to understand. He published this work, uh, an, an incredibly well-written, wonderful book called The Dialogues on the Chief World Systems. However, in it, he basically made fun of things the Pope had said, very directly and very recognizably. What it is is it's a conversation. I mean, think about this. This is a scientific text. They're usually written in Latin. This was written in Italian. And instead of it being a very formal book, it's a conversation between three friends about which of these world systems must be true. Is it the geocentric system or the heliocentric system? And it plays out over a number of days. Now, obviously, Galileo was putting the wise words into the, the mouth of the character that said that the sun was in the middle. The person that said the earth was in the middle was actually called Simplicio, the simple one. And there were quotes that directly were recognizable as things the Pope had said. So the Pope may never have read this book. We don't actually have any record the Pope read it. But people sure showed him those passages and told him that Galileo was making fun of him. Now, an, an unanswered question is what was Galileo thinking? You know, couldn't he have couched this a little bit more politically? Couldn't he have done this a little bit more gently? But at the time, this was, in fact, the straw that broke the camel's back. I mean, this one work alone might not have done it, but after heaping disdain on the astronomers, pushing the political boundaries, it snapped. And they brought him to trial before the Inquisition. So he was found vehemently suspect of heresy, 
Uh, three cardinals out of the ten abstained, actually. So there, not everybody voted against him. The dialogues were banned, and, and, and they were just, you were not allowed to have a copy on pain of jail, I think. The dialogues were finally, the Catholic Church finally lifted the ban in 1835, by the way. And uh, we were talking a little bit before, we may have a chance to talk afterwards. Um, Pope John Paul II did try to get some sort of forgiveness of Galileo. And I've, I've been told that the subtlety is that he was never actually forgiven, but there's some sort of dispensation, which we can talk about. But in 1992, they did, I think they at least let him out of hell, according to. <laughs> so Galileo was arrested. Uh, they threatened to put him in jail for life. There, there is, is some evidence that he was shown the instruments of torture and said, if you don't recant your belief, this is what we're going to do to you. And at, at that point, I think very wisely, he recanted publicly and said, no, you know, the, the earth must be in the center. There's, there's the wonderful tale of him possibly saying as they dragged him away, you know, but it still moves. He may not have done that. I wouldn't do that before the Inquisition. Um, he was put under house arrest. That was actually a, a little bit of a milder sentence. They did threaten him with prison for life. The Florentine officials intervened and got him under house arrest. So he stayed under house arrest for the rest of his life. He was allowed to have pupils, and he actually did some non-controversial things like laws of motion. I'm going to be a little conscious of the time here because I think people probably have places they want to get. I would love to talk to you a bit more about the laws of motion because he, d he actually observed some incredibly profound things. The idea that a pendulum, when a pendulum swings, the period, the time it takes, doesn't depend on how the amplitude, how far it swings, but just on the length of the pendulum. Isn't that a weird idea? So think about a big pendulum and you make it just swing a little bit. It takes the same amount of time as if it were swinging a lot. The time of a pendulum, nobody ever noticed that before? Amazing. The idea of acceleration, the, the dropping balls. You know, the, the balls actually probably were never dropped from his hands because it's too hard to measure when they actually hit the ground. This is actually a reconstruction of an apparatus where he timed the balls rolling down a slope and timed very accurately what the acceleration was to determine there was no difference between the two balls. And then in 1642, he'd gone blind. He complained of heart palpitations. He was never in particularly good health during his imprisonment, and then he died. Um, he's buried in this, uh, I've actually visited his grave in Florence. Interestingly enough, he's buried with his daughter, Maria Celeste, and that's the only other person who shares his grave. So the, the two were affectionate to the last. She unfortunately died young. She lived to be 33 years old. Uh, and uh, so he actually lived past her, but uh, the two are buried together. So let me just end then by saying that as an astronomer, you know, we honor Galileo in many ways. Um, I love the fact that we actually did end up naming the moons of Jupiter after him. These are the Galilean satellites, not the Medicean stars. Uh, these are the four largest moons of Jupiter. They're, they're actually worlds unto themselves. It's worth noting these are not the only moons. This is actually an animation of the moons of Jupiter. The major ones here, the Galilean ones, are named. But we're actually going to pan out and look at all the different moons that there are. So those are the, the major ones we know of. But uh, I, I'm losing track. I think we know of over 70 moons that we track the orbits of around Jupiter. So there's some other ones there going farther out. Yeah, there's a lot more moons of Jupiter than you might know. <laughs> but uh, the Galilean satellites are the largest of the moons of Jupiter. I think, are we? Oh, yeah. Um, here's actually, they're, they're worlds unto themselves. This is a picture of Io. Uh, Io is the most volcanically active body in the solar system. And those are Io's northern lights you're seeing. See that little glow there? Those are actually the northern lights on Io. Um, another one, th there's Io again. Uh, incredible thing. I mean, it's actually yellow because of sulfur and huge volcanic explosions going off all the time. Europa is one of the places where NASA is going to look for life. There's very interesting suggestions that there might be life underneath this ice. There's liquid water underneath this, this, this surface. And not only is there liquid water, but when you look at the cracks, it's got some interesting chemistry. There's some organic compounds in it. There's some neat stuff welling up through the cracks. There may be life on this moon. This may be the first place we find life. And of course, we named the Galileo satellite, a Jupiter observer after Galileo. So in conclusion, Galileo, to me, is a very recognizable figure. I, I, I admire this person so much. And his obs the idea that observation trumps philosophy, we have to observe the natural world, even if it doesn't fit with what we're comfortable with, with what the church says. Science and theology are separate. There is no need for them to get into arguments with each other. The idea also of self-promotion. I mean, I mean, I was taught as a graduate student, if you don't publish it, it doesn't exist. You, you publish, you get things out, you make yourself known. I have not done active research for the last 10 years. My full-time job is public outreach. So I'm an astronomer employed by NASA full-time. I'm the assistant director of science at Goddard. 
but my full-time charge is to make sure people like you are getting some of these messages. And also this wonderful story of personalities, patronage, politics. Science always was like this, I'm sure, back to Aristotle. But it's so wonderful and obvious the way things went right and wrong for Galileo. It's an incredible story. The sheer brilliance of this person inspires me today. And I'll end. I'm actually going to just sort of uh, bring this microphone down. I'm going to show you a wonderful little honor to Galileo they did on the moon for Apollo 15. You've heard about the, the, the reason you drop two balls and they fall down at the same time is that the acceleration of gravity doesn't have to do with something's mass. And somebody, people will say, okay, well, how about a hammer and a feather? You know, they don't fall at the same time. Well, that's because the feather has you know, air resistance and kind of floats down. So this was done on the moon. They used a hammer and a feather. And uh, here's the astronaut. Thank you very much. <laughs> this has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.